Friday Live. My name is Walter Latham. I'm your host, and I'm joined by Michelle Sweeney McCombs, and she's your co-host. Today is what I guess in TV or radio vernacular is a special edition of our podcast. We have been honored by and graced by a very, very special person that she represents to us what the mandate and what our mission was when we started the Walt Weekly Podcast. So she's, she typifies and everything that she does, she's an example of what we hope to do and hope, how, how we hope to grow. So with that said, I would like to, without giving, without giving her a name, because that's Michelle's area, uh, but I do want to thank her uh, to the bottom of, of our hearts, and I think I speak for the Walt Weekly, podcast uh, that you know we are honored honored to have you on our show and without further ado let me turn it over to michelle sweeney mccombs thank you walter um welcome everybody and good evening welcome to the walt weekly friday live thank you to our live audience for joining us please follow the walt weekly and share this podcast by clicking the share button below we appreciate that the walt weekly is brought to you by Michelle Sweeney Hair and Skin Care. Our intro and outro music is provided by Uncle Nephew. Let me, before I introduce our special guests, let me uh, introduce our weekly panel, our amazing panel that has joined us. And we are, you know, grateful to them for joining us on a weekly basis. And uh, I'll start with Gregory Coleman, owner of Illumination Media and Technology. He's also the engineer at the Walt Weekly. We have Ernest J. Robinson out of Washington, D.C., a veteran sergeant and newly re-enlisted U.S. Marine Corps, senior consultant at B. Ernest Leadership and professional consultant. We have Christopher Sweeney out of New Jersey, a retired sanitation worker and CEO of Johnny Roof's Smokehouse. We also have Poet and author Judy Andrews out of Brooklyn, New York. We also have just joining us Honorable Jean Ed Edwards, male district leader out of the 79th District, Bronx, New York. Welcome panel. Now we have a special guest, yes. I'm so excited to bring on this special young lady. I'm just, you know, I'm honored. I'm really honored. Today's guest, I'm honored to introduce biographer, journalist, author, and great-great-granddaughter of Madam C.J. Walker, author of non... Yes. Yes. Thank you, thank you. She's a former ABC News Washington Deputy Bureau Chief and Chair of the National Archives Foundation. She has written four books about her great-great-grandmother. One of them is a national bestseller, On Her Own Ground, The Life and Times of Madam C.J. Walker, which was also the inspiration for the movie Self-Made, the fictional four-part Netflix, Netflix series starting, starring Octavia Spencer. Please welcome Alaya bundles welcome Ms. bundles thank you so much i'm delighted to be with you all <laughs> thank you you wear a lot of hats <laughs> we appreciate you coming it's truly an honor to have you on the walk weekly i know i stalked you for a little while <laughs> I and it. i also you know you guys you have to get that book um on her own ground 
the original book and also the self-made book. Um, I was honored to get a postcard photo of the self-made book and Miss Bundles signed it for me and she actually mailed it to me. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Listen, and if you I, haven't I checked it. out I that movie. That you mm -hmm. love the story, so yes, I so yes, I love the story. She's my inspiration of why I do what I do right now. So I just would like you to introduce yourself, even though I, I gave a lot about you. Just tell sure. us about your hum, your humble beginnings. Sure. So I my name is Alelia Bundles, and I am Madam Walker's great, great granddaughter and biographer. I grew up in a household where both of my parents worked in the hair care business. So I was in, in a household of entrepreneurs. My mother was vice president of the Madam C.J. Walker Manufacturing Company when I was growing up. And my parents wanted me to do my thing, and they were not pressuring me to be in the quote-unquote family business. And my uh, real passion was writing. So I became a journalist and went to Columbia Journalism School, for because I know you guys are in New York. And right. uh, fortunately for me, my advisor at uh, Columbia was the only Black woman on the faculty, Phyllis Garland who had written for Jed and Ebony and whose mother had been the editor of the Pittsburgh Courier and still yes. recognized my name, Alelia, and asked if I had a connection to Madam Walker and Alelia Walker, because I was not really talking about that. That was not right. the center of my life. And because I feel recognized that I had this family connection, she's the one who put me on this path. And she said, that's what you're going to write your master's paper about and that was almost 50 years ago incredible wow can you tell us a little bit about your journalist career sure i i started as an editor of my newspaper in junior high school but right. ultimately i um became i worked at the radio station in college and then i became a producer at nbc news where i worked for 13 years in New York, Houston, and Atlanta, and D.C., and then I worked for 16 years at ABC News, where I was Deputy Bureau Chief of Producer and Director of Talent Development. I split my time between D.C. and New York. So I had a 30-year career in network television news, and on the side, my right. side gig was doing the research for these books on Madam Walker. Yes, I know it must have taken a long time to do that, but as a child, I know growing up in the household um when did you realize who she was how 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 old were you when you found out well, you about know, your I mean, family's well, legacy actually before i understood the the you know sort of the significance of them when i mm -hmm. was about three years old is when i first began to discover the walker women in the apartment where my grandparents had lived my grandmother had died in 1945 and we my parents and i moved back to Indianapolis in 1955. And so I, my mother and I would spend time with my grandfather and I would, while they talked, I would go into the bedroom that had been my grandmother's bedroom and open up the dresser drawers. And in those dresser drawers were things that had belonged to all the Walker women. Miniature mummy wow. that Alelia Walker had bought when she was in Cairo in 1922 ostrich feather fans, mother of pearl opera glasses, and then the silverware that we used every day right. had Madam Walker's monogram. But my mother was vice president of the Walker Company. So I knew, you know, sort of on the side, I knew that there was a connection, but my parents fortunately did not make it a big deal. But right. it was part of who I was growing up. Amazing, amazing. As a child, that's uh, such a gift to find out the legacy of your family. That's mm -hmm. amazing. So um, I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of your great, great grandmother. Can you just give us a little bit in reference to how she started her business in the 1800s? How um, she got the name Walker, mm -hmm. the Walker name, how she developed her products. Can you give us a little bit about that? Absolutely. So the, so the um, you know, the, the minute and a half biography. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. I'm good. Right. I was going to talk so, to you. About, so, yeah, actually speak about that right. because that's so Hollywood's born, version. Yes, exactly. So she was born Sarah Breedlove in right. 1867 on the same plantation in Delta, Louisiana, on the Mississippi River, where her parents and older siblings had been enslaved before the Civil War. First child in her family born free. Orphaned at seven, 
um, moved in with an older sister. Her brother-in-law was so cruel. She said that she got married at 14 to get a home of her own. Wow. Her first husband, Moses McWilliams, died when she was 20. She had a young child named Alelia. And she was not moving back in with the cruel brother-in-law. And so she moved up the Mississippi River to St. Louis, where her older brothers had moved a decade earlier, and they were working as barbers at a time when Black men dominated the barbering trade. They were members of St. Paul AME Church. And it was the women of St. Paul who looked at Sarah Breedlove, the poor, illiterate washerwoman who had a good enough voice to be in the choir, who volunteered for the Missionary Society. And those women began to give her a vision of herself as something other than an illiterate washerwoman. Her hair began to fall out. She experimented with different formulas. She worked for a while for Annie Malone, who later became her big competitor, but she developed right. her own product and then started her company, which ultimately uh, employed thousands of other women. Uh, and then she used her wealth as a philanthropist, as a political activist, and as a patron of the arts. So that's my my two minute Amazing. <laughs> biography. Right, right. I know um, a little bit about her. Um, the She had a factory in, in Indianapolis, correct? Right. right. So, you know, they speak about the Black Wall Street. She actually had the first Black Wall Street. Am I correct? Or Well, you know, there, the thing that, that we should know is that there were many people in that first generation uh, out of slavery who right. were starting businesses. And even before the end of the Civil War, there were Black entrepreneurs. Booker right. Washington founded the National Negro Business League in 1900. So Tulsa was one area, Chicago, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Indianapolis. There were several different, A Atlanta, there were several different places because we had, we were segregated. And so we had to make our own businesses. People, had, right. they knew they were already doing these jobs as cobblers and mm -hmm blacksmiths and seamstresses. We were doing the work because we were creating everybody else's thing. So we had those skills. Right. And in that first and second generation out of slavery, people were creating their own businesses. Right. And she also gave other people opportunity because I know in her factory, she also housed barbers. Right. She, right. right. Well, Lawyers. Ultimately she had when she had her first beauty school, she was she started. She was in St. Louis. She moved to Denver. Um, then she and C.J. Walker, Charles Joseph Walker, which is how she got the name Madam C.J. Walker, that right. was her third husband. They traveled around. Her daughter was in Denver for a while. And then ultimately they were in Pittsburgh together where she opened her first beauty school called Lelia College, named after her daughter. And then right. she moved to Indianapolis where she had her headquarters and built a factory. But in each of those places, she was employing women both in her factory and she was training sales agents um, as she traveled around the country. So women, she would teach them how to do hair, how to sell the products, and then they became uh, her agents who were teaching other people and who were selling her products. Amazing. She um, Can you tell us about her activism? I know she uh, was great friends with W.E.B. Du Bois. Right, and um, Ida B. Wells. Ida B. You know, Wells, yes. So one of the things that is that... Um, as I have done my research through the years, you know, you start out thinking one thing and then you get new information and, and try to synthesize it and bring it together. So one of the things that was interesting to me is, yes, she created this hair care product. It was essentially a shampoo and an ointment like Vaseline that contained sulfur because people had, because this was a time when most people didn't have indoor plumbing. So they didn't wash their hair very often. They had really bad dandruff and bad serious scalp infections. And that was really what her wonderful hair grower was addressing. But as she was developing that and, and really solving a problem that many Black women had with, their, with hair loss, she, I think, began to realize that, yes, people needed that product. They were glad to have it. The product worked. But what these women she was meeting as she traveled around the United States, the Caribbean, and Central America, what these women needed was economic independence so that they did not have to go to work uh, as maids and laundresses and sharecroppers. They needed some way that they could have some independence and some economic freedom. And that was what that became. And so the hair care products in some ways became 
a means to an end. When she had her first convention of her sales agents in 1917, at what had to have been one of the first national conventions of women entrepreneurs in America, at that convention, this was where her activism came into play. She gave prizes not just to the women who had sold the most products, but to the women whose local clubs had given the most money to charity. And she told the women, I want you to understand that as Walker agents, your first duty is to humanity. I want others to look at us and realize that we care not just about ourselves, but about others. And at right. the end of the convention, the women sent a telegram to President Woodrow Wilson urging him to support legislation to make lynching a federal crime. So it's like be an entrepreneur, sell the products, but make a difference in your community. Right, right. Amazing. So I'm going to go into the self-made movie. Uh huh. Did you have any input in, uh, well, the script one, any, any input in telling the story? Because I know from reading your books, there's some, you know, untruths in there. Did you have any control over that? <laughs> yes, there's some untruths in there. So, you know, I, so I think most people know that, um, Often, you know, a writer will do a book and once you have um, made a deal with a studio, you don't really have ultimate control over what gets on the screen. And in my case, I had had some earlier, uh, you know, earlier involvement where out Al when Alex Haley was going to do this, we, we were partners in something. Alex died before he finished. But my early experience was we had meetings on Alex's farm. We had historians and casting directors and producers, and we were all working together. My nice. experience, unfortunately, with Warner Brothers and Netflix was very different because although I was told in the beginning that I would be very involved and that my nonfiction book was respected by the producer who signed, um, who optioned the book, Ultimately, once they hired a writer, the writer and I had very different beliefs and perspectives about telling the story. And I had a conversation with the writer, Nicole Jefferson, who told me in that first conversation that she wanted to focus on a conflict between two black women, between Madam Walker and her competitor. Right. And I said, I, you know, I think that's an interesting dimension, but I would not make that the centerpiece. And when I said that, apparently, that made her unhappy. And so she intentionally kept me out of the conversations. But the hmm. contract said that I had script review. And so right. before they could start shooting, they had to show me the scripts. So I reviewed the scripts and I did what the Hollywood speak is, gave notes. Right. I told them what I did not like. They changed some of it. They didn't change other things. So ultimately, right. I will say Octavia Spencer was great. Yes. I love the, her tenacity and the fact that she embodied Madam Walker's perseverance. I loved the scene where Madam Walker is recruiting the other women. But there is a lot in the story that is not accurate. Not Right. Right. That's correct. So you guys have to get that book on her own ground, The Life and Times of Madam C.J. Walker, to find out the full story of this legacy. So I'm going to turn it over to Walter. Can I just, yeah. can I just, say, can I just mm -hmm. say this? You know, one of the things that Hollywood is getting better yes. about portraying our stories, mm -hmm. but I think the studios that, you know, understandably, they want to make their money back. Right. And so they're nervous about doing something that doesn't fit into a formula. And unfortunately, the formula is not very nuanced when it comes to Black people. So the writers felt they needed to have a numbers runner and a pimp <laughs> as a foil yeah. to Madam Walker's attorney. And that was just so, it was 180 degrees different from who Madam Walker's attorney was. Right. And they just couldn't see their way past that. And to see to see the women of the National Association of Colored Women, these were Black women who founded a national organization in 1892. Many of them were college educated, had traveled internationally, 
but the writers who were black women felt that they needed to portray them as women who had to be coaxed out of the kitchen. Right. And instead of yeah. telling our story about that first generation of black folks right after slavery who were creating institutions and organizations and businesses, it doesn't fit into the stereotype. And so it's really hard <clears throat> to get folks to, to expand their minds to see that. But there are people who are doing that, who, who see that, that our story needs to be told in a new way. And so that's what I'm going to keep working for. Thank you. That's amazing. So, Walter, I know you have something you would love to ask her. I'm well, gonna... mine is going to, <laughs> my question is going to attract to, uh, you know, production. Her years spent in television, television yes. news. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, you know, we, we have spoken about mainstream media and what we, the end result is what we see on television. I guess mm -hmm. after goes through that process. Okay. As an executive producer uh, in TV news, do you think that there is an extreme filtering or are we, you know, what, what is your, what can you say? And I think what I'm trying to ask is I've always believed that we're not hearing the true story or they, you know, you had the 24 hour news cycle and we're not hearing what we should hear. I don't, is it, you know, we all have common sense. We were educated in this and that, but I think as far as what they, they 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 say as okay these are the headlines of the day and this is what we're going to, how is that how does that come about and who makes the final decision on what we hear because it's filtered and that's always been my conclusion and well, I, I, I think yes it be, because people are in a room every you know when they the because i've been in those meetings for many many years i was in those morning meetings where they're deciding what is this what needs to go on the air. And in that case, for instance, for when I worked at ABC News, World News Tonight was the half hour mm. show at 630. And so you can have maybe eight stories, eight to 10 stories. And so in that morning meeting, it's like, what are the things that we have to have in the story? And then something big happens. And then you throw out three of the stories because you have to put another one in. That's a, spe a very specific broadcast. But I think now there are so many outlets that, for me at least, I don't rely on any one newscast. And I and I think I look at different things. So my, my news, um, you know, menu every day. I st I listen to NPR in the morning because that gives me an overview. Okay. I listen to BBC radio because that gives me an international perspective that's often a little different skew than American news. Right. I read three or four different newsletters on media and on politics in the morning, so I have a general sense. I look at the newsletter from the New York Times to see what the stories are. I also read The, the Atlantic. I look at The Root. You know, I look at yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So I don't, I yeah. just think you can't say, for me, I don't take any one source because I think there is some fabulous journalism going on and there's some fabulous um, African-American, Black writers who are doing great journalism. There's some great investigative reporting, ProPublica. Uh, other places. Mm. So I just think mm -hmm. that you, you know, for me, it's like I have to look at a lot of different sources, and I don't believe anyone. I mean, that, that, but I do believe sources that I trust. I'm not watching Fox News. I'm not really interested in, you know. I, I mean, if I see something that they do, because I want to know what some of the crazy people on Fox. Yeah, you want to know what they're thinking. Right? I want to know <laughs> what they're thinking, but I'm not going to pollute my, you know, my diet, my news diet with a steady stream of what they're doing, because I know that they're not telling the truth. But I just think, we, you know, as news consumers, it's important for us to consult a lot of different things and not, you know, not think, oh, this is right. I mean, I think right now, I mean, just to sort of to tie this up, you know, right now, the coverage from Afghanistan, there's a lot of, it's a very interesting kind of laboratory because mm -hmm. there are, different perspectives on, you know, did Biden do the right thing? Did the administration do the right thing? What should they have done? 
should we have been there in the first place? I mean, there's a lot of conversation going on about that right now. And it's a, and so I think we just, sometimes you have to just step back and say, who is, who, what is the person, what is that news organization's interest in telling the story the way they tell it? Okay. Right. Well, yeah. What is it? How are they trying to turn the story or uh, turn the story or spin? Right. I, I think how that's the term I'm looking for. How are they spinning it? Uh -huh. And uh, you know, and and why would they spin it? And why would they spin it? Exactly. Okay. Yes. Yes. All Thank right. you. Thank you, Walter. Um, Miss Bondas, I'd like to ask you one more question about your grandmother, the joy goddess of Harlem's 1920s. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Can you tell us about your grandmother a so, little bit? So, you know, this is now. This is what I've been working on. This book. It took. I, I worked on the my on on her on ground for a decade because when you're writing about people who about whom nothing has really and not no books have been written, you've got to do a lot of original research and you know it's letters and it's travel, right. it's newspapers. So it takes a long time to write about somebody major for the very first time. Mm -hmm. As I'm writing about Madam Walker's daughter, one of the things that has been frustrating for me is that a lot of people have written about her, but they've written a paragraph or a page, and they've kind of recycled a lot of inaccurate information. And that, so this book, I am trying to tell her story in full, to take her beyond the kind of caricature of Madam Walker made the money, her daughter spent the money, had parties right. in Harlem. When in fact she was, you know, nobody is, is that pathetic, I have to say. <laughs> but she, she moved to Harlem in 1913. She knew the artists and writers and musicians and actors. Mm -hmm. She had a place where people loved to be. And she was kind of a magnet for the social and cultural scene. So that while she was not her mother, uh, and she did not found a business. She did create an environment that allowed people to come together. So that's been, so in writing that and showing all of the people that she knew, I'm really hoping that I'm going to recreate Harlem between 1913 and 1931 with some perspectives that people haven't already pulled together. Fantastic. So now I'm going to turn it over to the panel. Um, Hello, panel. Please keep. <laughs> so please keep your questions Hello. brief Hello. and hopefully a question that was not already asked. Judy, um, you start with the first question, please. Uh, yes, it is such a pleasure to um, have this experience with you, Ms. Bundles. Uh, I'm a member of the Harlem Writers Guild, and oh, we talk wonderful. about the Harlem Renaissance all the time. <laughs> uh, I, I have a question. Um, what is the most joyous experience you've had in sharing the story of your great great grandmother, Madam C.J. Walker? What a great question! But you know, I I came to one Harlem Writers Guild uh, meeting years ago. It must have been in the seventies. One of my good friends, Donna Ford. Um, oh my goodness! Yes, I know. I remember there. Donna I Ford. Terry yes. I yes, Terry yes, was Terry still, Miller. Still a member. Yes. So how long ago that was? So yes, yes, that was when I was only dreaming of, of being published. <laughs> so I am, I am glad to make that connection with you. But you oh, know, wonderful. joyous. Oh God, there's so many things. I'll tell you one of the most recent ones was um, the Pierre Moss a fashion show for for Paris Fashion Week. Kirby Jean Raymond, the designer, had his event at Villa Loaro, Madam Walker's house in Irvington, New York. And wow. that was just like a day of Black excellence all the way around from music to fashion wow. to dance. And so that was, that was like, I felt like a, a kid in a candy store to be able <laughs> to be a part of that. Um, but, you know, whenever, and I'll, t you know, and these are, this will, this is like not, um, a, you know, sort of a spectacular, splashy thing, but it is such a privilege to be able to tell Madam Walker's story because she touches people in so many ways. So I have had the privilege of speaking with women in the college course at Bedford Hills Correctional Facility. 
And they mm -hmm. had read Madam Walker's book and they studied it and they knew the stories and they knew had great questions. And then on the other end of the spectrum, and maybe we shouldn't even say it's the other end of the spectrum, but talking with students, international students at Harvard Business School. So Madam Walker really gives me a platform to reach a lot of different people. And that, that brings me great joy. Oh, thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you for asking. All right. Any further questions from the panel? I know y'all got, got a bunch. Yeah. So, uh, Greg? It's a, a pleasure talking to you, Miss Bundles. My pleasure. The question was more about, you know, just um, being, uh, I won't say, I mean, recipient might be a bad word of the, you know, amazing legacy of, of Miss Walker. Um, then you kind of creating your own legacy by, you know, stepping into the journalism arena. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about how it was at that time that you stepped into that industry to navigate what was primarily a uh, white male dominated industry? I mean, yes. uh, <laughs> yeah, well, that's a, that's a good question. Good and question. You know, I really, I do have to thank my, my parents and especially my mother for, having the wisdom to know that I needed to have my own thing and my own accomplishments. And so that was, you know, all the encouragement that I got from, from my parents to pursue my interest in journalism so that I wouldn't be, you know, just the great, great granddaughter of somebody who other people knew that I, that I needed to have, you know, some skills and some expertise on my own. So that was important, but I really followed, my passion, and I was fortunate to have, you know, starting in seventh grade <laughs> with a, a and, and I went to, I'd say, you know, people say predominantly white schools. I went to overwhelmingly white public schools in Indianapolis, but I was lucky to have teachers who, you know, really encouraged me and who mentored me. And, you know, despite the, all the, you know, the crazy stuff that would go on in that environment. And that prepared me so that when I, got to the point where I was at NBC uh, and at ABC. I mean, I knew what I was doing and I was good at what I did. And so I did have that confidence. So it was um, pretty impossible for somebody to um, try to intimidate me. And, you know, fortunately there were enough people who, you know, who agreed that I knew what I was doing, not in an arrogant way, but we were colleagues and the people who were, uh, the haters just, you know, I just kept moving on past them. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, you know, and I, you know, I feel like this as I, when I look at young people now, and I, I love talking with young folks and who, you know, they're doing some amazing things. There's so many more opportunities for them. For me, when I started out, you know, they, I was kind of coming out of the era where there were still just women's pages in, in the news, in the newspaper. I was one of the first women to become a producer at NBC, but that was because women had sued the networks and had sued Newsweek. And so women would be hired as secretaries and researchers and young men would be hired as desk assistants and associate producers, and they would become executive producers and the women would still be secretaries 40 years later. Right. So I was re a recipient of that early push for women to have more opportunities. But I look now at this, you know, new generation and there, my goddaughter is, you know, she's just left the Atlantic as a senior editor and she's gone on, she's on a new venture that she's doing. And I'm just so excited that they're doing things. It's not to say that there's not still, you know, discrimination or there's not still some barriers, but they have the confidence and they're just pushing through. And I'm, I'm loving that. Awesome. Thank you, Greg. We're going to go to Christopher next. He has a question. Good evening, Ms. Bundles. Hi. Uh, I, I just want to say, first and foremost, I can co-sign my sister's excitement that she's been talking about this show <laughs> and trying to get you, like you you, you guys are uh, such, a, you know, yes. such an inspiration to her. So I just yes. wanted to put that Michelle, out there. Thank you. Thank you. Also, um, you know, you are uh, uh, an accomplished journalist and writer and all kinds of things. But at what point in your career did you recognize, you know, because you come from a, a legacy family, right? 
And sometimes we want to do our own thing and build our, you know, build out, make, blaze our own path. And, you know, just so that we say we, we did something right. But right. at what point did you recognize that you needed to take control of the narrative of your great, great grandmother? Well, you know, I had to grow into it. I mean, I think if I think if I had um, if it had been pushed on me early on um, without me having a chance to kind of have my own wings, I don't think I would be as good at doing this as I am because that it would have felt kind of oppressive and kind of an, an obligation. And instead, it's it's a privilege and an opportunity for me. And it was really having Phyllis Garland, my professor at Columbia, again, the only black woman on the faculty, because nobody else would have recognized this name, Alelia, and it would, it would have just been, you know, a weird colored name. Uh, and Phil understood the significance of that and really affirmed um, the importance of it for me. And that began to push me on the path. And then over time, there were, you know, very few books were being published by or about Black people in the 1970s, mid-1970s, when I finished Columbia. But there were, a, Alex Haley approached this, there were a few people who understood the significance and who were propelling me on to the next level. And then over time, I began to realize, you know, there there are stories, these stories, not just my family, but Black folks, some famous, some not famous, who have amazing stories that need to be told, that it is our responsibility, again, and privilege to tell these stories. I mean, I just read, I just read the most incredible book called All That She Carried by Taya Miles, who's a Black woman uh, history professor at Harvard. And she wrote about, you've heard about Ashley Sack, the sack that was given to a nine-year-old young girl in the 1850s as she was being sold away from her mother. Right. And yes. so that book is that's she's not a famous person, but it is a significant story for us. We have to tell our stories. And so I feel like I'm doing what the ancestors need me to do. Absolutely. Definitely. Appreciate that. Thank you, Chris. Thank Ernest. You. Yes, yes. Ernest, you're up. It's on you, brother. Yes, we I'm can... here. Hi, Jay. I'm here. How are you doing, Mrs. Bundles? This is I'm fantastic. Good. I can I can literally listen to you for hours. <laughs> And not not so much about your great great grandmother in particular, but 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 as far as you and all your accomplishments, because I my uh, first cousin Jelaine, she's been at ESPN for over twelve years, and she's the recipient of two Emmy awards. And let me wow. tell you something, with with all of those credentials and accomplishments, she's catching hell trying to move up because she doesn't have that quote unquote look. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Wow. Like, mm -hmm. like she, she, she has dreadlocks. She's a little bit overweight. She doesn't look like Kamala Harris, so she doesn't get the same opportunities mm -hmm. as the sisters that that look like Kamala. You wow. understand? So, so some some of the nonsense and bias is still out there. So for you to have yep. done done what you did for thirty years at major networks like NBC and ABC, I applaud you. I applaud you, Mother Queen. I applaud Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my, my question for you is, since I'm in politics, I'm, I'm a locally elected official, uh, nationwide, women have been uh, seeking higher office from the federal level to the, to the state level to the uh, local level. And here in New York City, in New York State, as you know, Governor Cuomo stepped down and Kathy Hochul is going to step in. I had the opportunity to meet Kathy Hochul uh, back in July at a, uh, at, an, at a political event. She's really a nice person. I believe she's going to do a good job. Here in the Bronx, the first Bronx borough president is going to be Vanessa Gibson. She'll be the first woman and the first black person to be the borough president. And then we have governors of state in like, you know, Minnesota and, and other states. So my question for you is, uh, how do you feel about the rise and in the, in the influx of women and black women in politics? Your thoughts? Oh, no, I mean, it, this is really an amazing time. And, you know, Letitia, um, the the uh, attorney general, um, I, why am I spacing her name? Help me out. Because everybody. Okay, Letitia James. No, because, Thank you, Letitia James. No, no, um, you, know why, you know why you're having a hard time? Because everybody calls Letitia. Because it's so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, but, right. you know, there are, 
you know, there, you know, we're fierce and it is, I mean, it is the combination of our entire community pushing people forward and being prepared because we always, we know we are, you know, twice as prepared and twice as skilled and all of those things. But when we get in the room, um, we make a difference. So I, I just, I think that there's, this is a moment, but I also know that at the same time that we are bringing our skills to the table, that we are moving into these positions, the backlash is fierce because there is such resistance to us being able to do what we can do well. And we are usually coming from the place of trying to make the communities better and to do the what's right for the community. But the partisan politics does not want us to be in positions of power. We keep doing what we do to make it better. We keep fighting. And Absolutely. I guess, you know, maybe that's one of the lessons of my life, because I'm, you know, I'm a woman of a certain age at this point. And right. so I graduated from high school in 1970. So you can do the math. And mm -hmm. I, that was a moment when there was a lot of activism and there was a lot of progress and there has been a lot of progress and people have moved into positions. And I just never, it never thought that we would now be at the place we are in 2021 where we are fighting the same fights and where it looks like the vote the vote is trying to be taken away from us nullification and voter suppression that it is more sophisticated now than it was in the 1950s 60s and 70s but make no mistake it is intense absolutely that's for yes, sure absolutely yeah thank okay. you for that gene ernest are you back in Ms. Yeah, I have Bundles. a question. Mm -hmm. okay. Go ahead, Walter. Uh, yes, Ms. Bundles. I have a question. Well, I was looking at some of your, your, your videos. Uh, mm -hmm. And there was a, one topic that you spoke about extensively. And I was wondering whether you can give us a short version of why our young people should know their history. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I think that, among other things, it gives us confidence when we know who we are, when we know who our families are. And again, you do not need to have a famous family member in order to have pride in the accomplishments of your family. The people who made a way out of no way, the, the grandmother who is a leader in the community, everybody has heroes in their family, and I just think it's really important. And I think that it is, it's so clear to me now, right now as the state legislatures and school boards are trying to prevent the teaching of the truth about American history, the truth about slavery, the truth about race and racism, they don't want their children to know the truth because they're afraid that all of us will know the truth and it will change our perceptions. What it should be doing is making us make want to make sure that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past, that we try to get rid of the racism, that we try to get rid of the structural racism. But if right. we know the history, we're able to counter those arguments. It's just exactly. really important. And, and I will just say this, that, you know, I was not interested in history when I was in in school, you know, and that's what I do every day now. But it was because history was poorly taught and inaccurately taught. My high school history book, the only time the Black people were mentioned, we were slaves, not enslaved right. people, as we say now. And I literally, my high school book said that slaves were contented and essentially better off when they were enslaved. Now, that was not true, I, but I, I was the only Black kid in the class, and I knew that it wasn't true, but I didn't have the information to counter it. Right. I didn't know about Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman. I didn't know about the my members of my own family who resisted slavery. Right. So we need to know our history so that we don't let other people pull the wool over our eyes. That's true. And we should teach our children as well. I know for one, my son, when he, he went to a black uh, nursery and it went to like the sixth grade and all they taught was our history. Mm -hmm. You know, so we ha we as a community, a black community, should be <clears throat> teaching our children as well. Right. So, yeah, thank you for that, Walter. That was great. Ernest, um, I heard you, so 
Yeah. Come Can you on, hear me now? Brother. Yes. All right, all right. So, so, uh, great evening, Queen Queen Bundles. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak to you. I um, wanted to share in the excitement, um, and it was a great question. I think that um, that Walter had asked because I've had the opportunity to visit um, Alex Haley's farm. Um, mm, for those who have definitely. not, I would encourage you to be able to do that because that in itself has a lot of history. Um, my my question is, and I guess as it pertains to history and tying everything together, have you been able to um, to get the documents of the women who attended those early conventions? Um, I'm asking because there was another young lady by the name of Maggie L. Walker mm -hmm. um, at the turn of the century, and this is not necessarily for just for you, but just for for everyone. Not because I'm sure you may know of her, um, but that also may you know stood for a, a lot of the great things that black women were doing that other black women that other black people weren't doing as she was one of the first uh presidents of uh charter to charter a bank down in richmond and she hosted a lot of events but have you been able to get like the 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 sign-in sheets or agendas or, or anything like that to 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 show what was being discussed who was leading those conversations and have you thought about, you know, compiling that um, for historical purposes? Yeah, no, great question. So I'll, just, so I'll talk about Maggie Walker first, and then I'll talk about the conventions. But Maggie Lena Walker, um, as you mentioned, was the founder of a bank in Richmond, Virginia, which people may know. She was the first woman, American woman, president of a bank. They were not related. They just coincidentally both married men named Walker who were not not related, but were, these two women were contemporaries. But Maggie Lena Walker is, a, you know, a major uh, figure in American history. And so folks, and there's a, her house is a National Park Service um, site. So people should learn about Maggie Lena Walker. Um, the Madam Walker's conventions, 1917, I do know actually quite a bit about the women who were her primary agents, uh, not all of the women who attended the conference, but I will say to you that one of the things, one of the reasons I think Madam Walker is more remembered than some of her um, contemporaries and some of her competitors, and there were quite a few black men and women who had hair care companies, not just Madam Walker and Annie Malone, but dozens of other people. But one of the reasons Madam Walker's legacy is as strong as it is, is because she had a knack for pulling together an executive team. You know, what we call a C-suite now. Her attorney, her manager of the factory, the women who were her major sales agents, her secretary. And these folks kept the records intact so that we now have almost 50,000 documents, letters, daily um, Incredible. list of sales, uh, business records, tax records, and those items are at, most of those items are at the Indiana Historical Society, where we donated this body of papers uh, in the early 80s. And many of those documents have been digitized. So that combination of that, as well as the personal items that members of my family save that make up my Madam Walker family archives. And we now, as many of you, anybody who's doing family history may know, newspapers.com, ProQuest uh, historical newspaper database, you can go through these old newspapers back to the Baltimore Afro-American in 1892 and Google, I mean, it's like, it's like Googling, but you sort of searching for family names or searching for Walker conventions or people who work for the company and you can find material about folks. So it's, it's, I, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it is certainly much easier than it used to be when I first started doing this research and I had to go to the microfilm. Wow. Yeah. I did my family tree, uh, five sides of it, and I got all of my information from Ancestry.com. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important to do the U.S. Census, because that's what they based it off of. Right. And, so, you know, yeah. one of the things I think that, again, because, I, you know, yes, I have a couple of fam famous people in my family. So, yes, they are in the black press. But you do not 
it, people I think would be surprised to find that their family members, you know, if they were active in the church, if they were active in a fraternal society, that their names will pop up in black newspapers. I mean, I've mm -hmm. done research for other people and, you know, their family members turn up who you think are not going to be in the newspaper, but they are because we were reporting on what was going on in our community. Right, right. That was a form of communication between That's us. That's right. That's right. Definitely. Awesome. Anyone else have an ex any extra questions before I continue? I, know, uh, Judy, I have a question. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, Judy. I have a question. I noticed uh, I was reading a few things about uh, Madam C.J. Walker and what's happening with her products today. And I noticed that um, her, some of her products are being sold at Sephora. Mm -hmm. which is uh, the beauty store uh, in Sephora in New York City. And I was wondering if you could talk more about that. Sure. So, you know, very exciting for me. Um, about, I don't know, eight, seven, eight, nine years ago, Richelieu Dennis, whose name you may recognize as <laughs> the founding CEO of Sundial Brands, which makes yes. Shea Moisture and New Shea Detroit. Moisture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Richelieu um, bought the trademark for Madam C.J. Walker. My family and the Ransom family, uh, the Madam Walker's attorney, the next generations ran the company in, a, in an estate, in a trust. And then that, but the company was, you know, it was kind of declining to be honest with you into the 1960s. And there were other black owned companies that were, as they say, disrupting the business model but the name and the reputation were still strong. That trademark in the 80s was sold to another company, a black owned company, but they did not do a lot with it. It just kind of was dormant. But Richelieu bought that trademark, um, it's, it's in the early 20s, 2010s, and, um, and, and started putting research and development into developing a product line. So for about four or five years, the products were at Sephora. There is a new um, a new line that's in development right now. I can't tell you much more right now. <laughs> that's wonderful, though. But um, mm -hmm. there will be, you know, in the early in early next year, there will be some new things out there, which is very exciting to me. That's great. Oh, that's we great. Will keep our audience and our followers up to date on that for sure. Great. Thank that's you. That's awesome. So, Walter. I'm yeah, right here. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the uh, your published book, your books that are out now. I think you yes. you published four and you're working on five. Is that correct? That's correct. Or that's exactly right. Okay. Uh, now the the latest one that you're working on is what is the title of that one and what is Joy, it about? The Joy Goddess of Harlem, Alilia Walker and the Harlem Renaissance. That's okay. And when do you expect when do you expect to bring that uh, to publication? So it, it should be out next year. I am almost finished with it. Um, each each of these chapters takes a long time because I put a lot of research into it. So I've written 30 chapters. Uh, okay. I have five or six more to go. I'm up to 1926. Alilia Walker dies in 1931. So I'm, okay. I can see All right. You're about two-thirds of the way there, I guess. Yeah, right. At, at least two -thirds. I would say maybe three-quarters of the way. I'm almost, <laughs> I'm almost there. Yeah, that was an amazing era. Okay. Do you think you'll be able to have that on the big screen as well? Well, you know, I, I it's a natural for the big screen. Um, yes. And I hope that it will be. I think that, um, you know, for all of the ups and downs, the double-edged sword of, of uh, self-made, I think it did prove that there's an interesting story. And I think in some ways, Alilia Walker's story, because it's Harlem Renaissance and it's the, right. you know, liveliness of the 1920s, it is almost an even more obvious uh, story for, you know, for n streaming or big screen or musical. There there's a lot that can be done and you've got all of the famous, all those famous people who are in it. So it's just an interesting story of black folks, you know, really for the first time in an urban area, children of enslaved people, grandchildren of enslaved people, just really getting their wings and just feeling like they can do anything. Right. Okay. Yes, yes. yes. 
Uh, quick question. Um, how was your relationship uh, working with Henry Louis Gates? You know, so, so Skip has been um, a big supporter of what I've of what I've done. And, you know, I know him. I met him because I went to Harvard for undergraduate school. And um, he is, you know, he's been at Harvard now for a few decades. And so he's always been aware of my work at the National Archives, where I was chairman of the National Archives Foundation. He's been a um, friend of the archives and has done a number of programs. So I've had the chance to interview him uh, when some of his books have come out. So, I mean, I, I think that he's he's always been somebody who's been supportive of the work I've done. And, you know, and I know that he, that he is, um, he makes us aware of our, of our history and cares a great deal about making sure that these family stories are told. Yes. Yes. Amazing. I'm going to just uh, shout out your books that are published. Thank you. Um, her bestseller was On Her Own Grounds. That was her first book, mm-hmm. right? Madam, Madam Walker Theater Center, right? The second one. And all about Madam C.J. Walker. And your next one was for yourself, your Rutgers University keynote speeches. Mm-hmm. And where can everyone uh, find so, your books? So that's a great, thank you so much. So mm-hmm. aleliabundles.com is my website. I also have madamcjwalker.com and it's M-A-D-A-M, no E, M-A-D-A-M-C-J-Walker.com. But on my website on aleliabundles.com, there are links to podcasts and videos and, and to the books as well. Right, right. Awesome. And also, um, I, I guess on mm-hmm. Instagram and um, Twitter, it's at Bundles. <laughs> Right. I'll put that in the notes in the chat room. So everyone, please follow her, purchase those books, teach your children about history within your family, and also Mrs. Walker's story and the legacy of the Walker family. Uh, Walter, anyone have anything else to say? We've taken up a lot of time, so I'm sure yeah, someone else has I another do. question. Go ahead, Jean. I do. Uh, Ms. Bundles. Do you have any mentoring program for young women, black women? Like, for example, my cousin has been in in the industry over a decade and is still finding it very challenging to uh, excel, although she's a two-time Emmy Award winner. Do you have mentoring programs for for women like this? You know, I don't don't have anything personally because I'm really – I, I have to tell you, honestly, I'm so um, consumed with trying to finish writing a book, which is kind of takes up all of my oxygen every day. Um, so I, and I'm way behind. So my editor really doesn't want me to do anything other than. Right, right. Writing. That's why you squeezed us in today. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, so no, no, thank right. you. I'm totally, totally happy yeah. to do it. But, but I do. Um, I do a lot of speaking and I, and I am part of organizations that are good. It's not so much mentoring as networking, but for instance, um, Richard Prince has a, a group called journal isms and she could, she may know about that group, but it's journal hyphen isms and she can Google that and Richard Prince and Richard has a monthly conversation with journalists, many of whom are National Association of Black Journalists members. But last month, it was a conversation with the sister who's the new head of MSNBC. Um, Mm -hmm. This month, it is another executive. But there's always a conversation with other people. And then within the group, people can network with, with each other. National Association of Black Journalists Convention is another great place to interact with people and to, you know, we are all, people are virtual right now, but you can, even with virtual, you can kind of spin off and have conversations. But I think it is, you know, those people who are more her contemporaries uh, who are going to be the folks who are, that she networks with who, who could be helpful. But, you know, one of the things, I will just say this, one of the things that helped me 
um, throughout my career. I mean, I always tried to do a good job and to, you know, do the best that I could and, you know, be a good colleague. But there were definitely times when I had bosses or supervisors who I didn't get along with or who weren't supportive of me. And, and when I hit those walls, I began to become very involved in my college alumni organization. And I pursued leadership roles in other organizations when I wasn't getting what I needed at my job. And those leadership opportunities help prepare me for the leadership opportunities that I ultimately had within my my professional organization. So there's more than one way to go about this, to make friendships, to make relationships with people who can help advance your career. Sometimes the job is not going to be the place that's going to give you the break that you need. You know what? Thank you for that, because I'm going to pass it on because she graduated from the University of Pittsburgh and she's a proud Delta, but I don't think she's as active with her sorrows as she should be. So I'm gonna pass that on and also the uh, National Association of Black Journalists. Right, yeah, so and the Deltas those- are fierce. So if, you know, I'm, if she wants, to, I'm sure they will help open some doors. And if nothing else, sometimes you just need somebody to give you some confidence, to give you a boost, to you know, a shoulder to cry on or whatever, but, you know, so that you don't say bad things to the people you work with every day. Cause I, you know, I, this has been my approach on this. I've always um, tried to not, I didn't want to curse anybody out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's not that I didn't yeah. want to, but I just knew that that was not the right, right approach, but yeah. I could say what I wanted somewhere else and go back in and, do what I needed to do until I could move on to the next thing. Yes. Thank you. Amazing. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you so much, Ms. Bundles. Mm-hmm. We appreciate you. We know you are busy. Um, thank you for joining the Walt Weekly. I'm going to turn it over to my host, Walter Lathan. Uh, yes, Olivia. I got, yeah, I have a granddaughter named Layla. L E I L A. So okay. when I when Michelle and I were first discussing, when she first brought up the fact that you would be appearing, because Michelle is relentless. <laughs> All right, she's been after you for nine months almost. <laughs> Every week we go through the, the show schedule, the podcast schedule, and your name is there. Do not remove that name. Let's oh, just leave so it. Nice. Do you have a date? No, just leave the name. Just leave the name. But anyway. <laughs> I hope it, was, I hope it has met your expectations. Uh, you, you exceeded yes, you our expectations. That, that, that is absolute. And we, we're so happy. We're so happy. So, But it was a hard time. I just want to share. It was a hard time for me to pronounce your name. I was saying Alayla, Alayla, Alayla. And right. I went into Wikipedia. Hopefully, I was looking for a breakdown, you know, something that would tell me how to pronounce your name, Alilia. And I got it from looking at the videos. Gotcha. Otherwise, I would, I would just, I would have to ask you, how do you pronounce your name, Miss Bundle? You know what? And I don't mind <laughs> at all. I don't mind at all. Yeah, I know you run across that because it, it's that was my first time encountering someone with your name. Right. Okay. So that anyway, is throws people off. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But you know, I just, I just want to thank you for joining the Walt Weekly Podcast Friday Live. And, uh, you know, we, we, we feel privileged. We, we can't extend our gratitude enough for you taking the time to be on our show. And I also want to thank the panel uh, for their questions and for their support. And, uh, you know, we, we admire you. And just thank keep on doing what you're doing because I'm very proud. Well, listen, uh, it's, been, it's an honor to be a part of this. I love the fact that you have had all of this previous career and accomplishments and that, that what you're doing now is trying to bring our stories forward. So I thank you so much. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And let me get to my, put on my engineering hat. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. All right. So you can take us out and say, please. Thank you. Yes. Next week's show, August 27th, we have Brittany for Congress and Afro Latino Staten Islander running for Congress. We hope you all enjoyed our show. Thank you, Walter. Thank you our weekly to our weekly panel members. Thank you, Ms. Bundles. 
You are a joy. We appreciate you. You just made the highlight of my life for my Shiro. Thank you. And I'm CJ Walker. And you can find us at thewaltweekly.com, IG and Facebook, Twitter, Walt Weekly, Podbean, Walt, the Walt Weekly, iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, and other streaming, streaming platforms. You can find us everywhere. Have an awesome weekend, Ms. Bundles. Thank you. Bless you. Good night, everybody. Panel, have a great weekend. Thank, Thank you. Yes. Blessings. All right. Have a great weekend. Thank you.